morning. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Chopin and Dr. Perpich for arranging these holiday lectures at Howard Hughes Medical Institute. I'd uh, especially like to thank those of you who've taken the trouble to come here today to participate in the audience. This is the first of four lectures that are going to be dealing with issues having to do with our senses, the way in which we perceive the external world. And there are really three motives that one might have for asking questions about how our senses operate. The first of these is philosophical in nature. We well know that our senses filter and distort what we perceive. The external reality out there isn't what we sense in our brains, but rather everything comes into our senses, is processed, and eventually reaches our level of consciousness. So in, uh, in order to try to understand the world around us, we need to understand what our senses do to distort and to alter uh, our percepts. The second motivation for studying senses is really a matter of intellectual curiosity, something that motivates a lot of us here today. Uh, and in a way, you can liken the nervous system to a computer. If you make that analogy, uh, of course, each individual nerve cell is like a single transistor and a chip. Each of the connections of the spinal cord, of the peripheral nervous system, or of the brain is like a cable or bus within a computer. And in that analogy, the sensory systems are rather like the inputs of the computational system. So in order to understand ourselves and understand our brains, we need to understand how these inputs work, how they flow into the brain, and how they're processed. And that also will be the topic we'll be discussing. And the third and final motivation, which is quite a profound one as well, is clinical in nature. The senses provide a useful way of understanding whether our nervous system is working properly. That's why doctors are forever looking in your eyes, tapping on your knees, and sometimes sticking you with pins and what have you, because the senses tell us whether there is a normal functional state of our nervous system or whether we need to be concerned about something. More importantly, deficits or problems with our senses have an enormous impact, and I'll, I'll mention two uh, statistics in that regard. First is blindness in varying degrees affects about 15 million people in the United States. And the annual cost of that problem in the United States is about $40 billion. Deafness, to greater or lesser extents, affects about 30 million people in the United States, about 10% of the population, at an annual cost around $60 billion. Now that cost includes the cost of medical care, of special education, and especially the cost of lost productivity because of these difficulties. There are, of course, other sensory problems as well, such as intractable pain, problems with balance, and what have you, that add to the total human impact and the total economic impact. Now, you all know that there are five classical human senses. Those are vision, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. But it turns out we have a great number of other senses that largely affect us subconsciously or pre-consciously that we ordinarily aren't aware of. You know, for example, that you're sensitive to temperature and to pain. You have an excellent sense of equilibrium. The fact that I can stand upright is due to the fact that the vestibular apparatus in my head is constantly telling me if I move from side to side and adjusting my posture to keep me upright. We have other still subtler senses. We have receptors that tell us if our blood pressure is too high or too low. We have chemical sensors that tell us if we have too much carbon dioxide in our blood and should breathe a little faster, or too little and should breathe slower, and that also measure the pH, the acidity, of our blood. And as many of you know, other species have still additional senses that we don't have at all. For example, uh, many of you may have seen outside the very nice presentation by Dr. Hopkins and his colleagues showing electrical fishes. Fishes and some amphibians are capable of, signaling, uh, of sensing electrical signals in their environment. And by that means, they can tell whether they're prey or predator animals nearby, or in some cases, they can detect passive ob uh, obstacles in their way and move around them appropriately. There are other senses, such as echolocation. Notoriously, we know that the animals with sonar include bats and whales, and there's also one species of bird, the oil bird, that uses active echolocation. And there's still stranger senses, such as magnetoreception. It turns out that some fishes and birds can actually measure the Earth's magnetic field and use it, for example, during migrations from place to place. So what we're going to be doing in this first talk is considering general principles of all of these senses. The idea is that all of these senses encounter formally similar problems. They all have to do pretty much the same thing. So rather than considering each sense in turn, I'll be taking examples from several different senses and mixing them together. The particular issues we'll be dealing with are, first of all, how do sensory systems capture sensory energy in the first place? 
How do they get that energy to receptor molecules that can analyze it? How do they transduce it? Transduction refers to the conversion of the stimulus energy into some sort of an electrical signal that's then suitable for interpretation by the brain. We ask uh, next how this signal can be amplified to make a, a meaningful signal that the nervous system can send elsewhere in the body. How do senses adapt to continuing stimulation? How do they adjust their sensitivity? And finally, we'll be asking how sensory cells can promulgate the information that they've captured throughout the nervous system, how they pass the information from one cell to the next. The moral of the story, which I can give you up front, is that senses are extremely highly evolved for extraordinary sensitivity. Time and time again, we'll find that sensory systems operate near the physical limits that set how sensitive they could possibly be. And that really makes a lot of sense when you think about it. In the state of nature, your survival depends upon being able to detect a prey animal or to detect a predator or to find a mate or whatever before the other guy does. The more sensitive your senses are in each and every case, the better your survival will be, the more likely it is that your genes will be passed down and that that sort of sensory apparatus will be uh, propagated. So you will see again and again throughout my talks and also Dr. Nathan's talks that extreme sensitivity is one of the characteristics of the senses. So what I want to start by doing is considering the very first step, the capture of sensory information. And th the real need there is to efficiently harvest whatever sensory information is in the environment. Again, you'll see that this is true of all the different senses, and you'll see a number of harvesting strategies to par excellence in photoreceptors of the eye and in the hair cells of the ear will be discussed in the second and the third lectures, respectively. So let's start with a very simple case, uh, uh, something of an antenna for capturing an input. And the simplest example of an antenna is, in fact, an antenna. Um, if you consider something like a moth, the male moth flies around with these large antennas sticking out, and there's a rationale for that. The male moth is looking for a female moth. And the way the male moth does this is it has the antenna sweeping through the air, trying to find molecules called pheromones, which the female secretes. So the female secretes a very dilute solution of these molecules. They're vaporized into the air and blow downwind from where the female is. So as the male flies towards the female, flying upwind, his antennae sweep through the air and occasionally capture a pheromone molecule. Now, what you find is that this enormously increases the chance that a single cell will be capable of harvesting a pheromone molecule. A single cell at the same scale might be represented by one of these little twiglets. That alone would be a very inefficient antenna. But the whole antenna works beautifully. And there are some physical subtleties to the way in which it works. For example, the antenna's obviously got a lot of empty space in it, and that's useful for the moth, because as he's flying upstream, he also doesn't want to do too much work. And if one had a really thick antenna like a palm tree, there would be much more work involved in flying along. Instead, this rather attenuated structure nonetheless captures most of the pheromone molecules. And that's because of something you already know about, which is diffusion. If you look at the path of any one of these molecules, it will be bouncing around in space like this as the male moth antenna approaches. So as the moth sweeps past this molecule, there's a very good chance that its molecular gyrations will cause it to hit the antenna and stick to it and be harvested. So this is actually much more efficient than it looks. There's another neat trick, and that is that these pheromone molecules are generally rather fatty substances, and the surface of the antenna is cuticle, which is a sticky, fatty material as well. So when one of these pheromone molecules, in fact, sticks to the antenna, it then skates around over the surface, rather like a cork floating on water, until it finally runs into one of the receptors, and at that point is harvested. That then sends, an inf sends information to the brain, telling it, yes, indeed, there's a female moth upwind. Let's keep going in the same direction. So this is a very efficient structure, allowing the animal to detect a limiting number of molecules. In fact, it's so good that it turns out that it achieves its physically realizable optimum. That is, a, an antenna can detect as little as a single pheromone molecule under the most favorable circumstances. Now, another kind of antenna that's familiar to all of us is one that we use uh, all the time, and that is the one associated with our, our knee-jerk reflex. When you go to a physician, one of the things that he or she does is sit you down and start tapping on this tendon with a little hammer, right? And if you hit it just right, you get a knee jerk. I went to medical school for four years so I can do this and make it work. 
Now, the rationale for doing that is it's a simple way of testing a reflex that involves information generated by sensory receptors here that runs up a nerve in the leg to the spinal cord where a synaptic contact is made. That information then flows from the spinal cord back down to the muscle and causes it to contract. And that reflex, when it's normal, tests the integrity of that entire pathway and indeed of that portion of the spinal cord. So what's going on in that reflex? And we can see something of the sort of antenna involved in this process. This represents <coughs> the, uh, upper abortion, the upper bone of the leg, the femur, and this represents the lower portion, the tibia, with the joint between them. And this is the muscle that's stretching from the one to the other, the muscle that's involved in this reflex. Now, along with the muscle fibers in this large muscle that do the actual physical work, there are little small organs called muscle spindles that are the sensory receptors. And there's a magnified version of a single uh, muscle spindle down here below. What happens when the doctor taps upon this is the muscle is transiently made to shorten. It, it transiently pulls upon the muscle, and that pull is transmitted to the muscle spindle, causing it to be extended as well. <clears throat> that extension, in turn, excites nerve fibers, which are wrapped in this spiral way around the little muscle fiber. An impulse is set up, and we'll see how it later, and the information is carried into the brain. So this is a little antenna. It's an antenna that's stretched across a big muscle, and it's an antenna that's meant to detect whether the big muscle has been elongated or shortened. It's a stretch receptive device. It doesn't meso measure muscle tension, you can appreciate that the best place to measure mus muscle tension is at the end of the muscle where it inserts into the bone. At that place, you find another sort of sensory organ called the Golgi tendon organ. The Golgi tendon organ represents little nerve fibers that run into the connective tissue so that when this muscle is stressed, that excites this set of nerve fibers and again, information flows to the brain. So with this apparatus, we are constantly monitoring both the lengths of each of our muscles and also the tension that each of our muscles bears. Now, one of the great, greatest uh, areas of advance in the last couple of decades in this area has been appreciating not only how antennae harvest stimulus energy in the first place, but how that energy is next funneled to particular molecular receptors that initiate the electrical response. And I want to take a very simple case uh, to illustrate how this receptor molecule uh, concept works. What I want to compare in this case is an ordinary bacterium to a submarine. These are two devices that are designed to move through a fluid environment. Both of them have rotary propellers that send them along their way. One of them is powered by a steam turbine, and in the case of a bacterium, there's a little rotary motor that's actually driven by a proton turbine. So protons, H+, moving through this device into the bacterial cell, power rotations of the propeller, and that causes rotatory wiggling of the flagellum and drives the bacterium forward. Now, for both of these devices to function well, they also need to have sensory apparatus that tells them which way they're going. So the submarine, of course, has stuff in the conning tower. It turns out that the bacterium has, over its surface, a series of sensory receptor molecules. These are scattered around. They detect appropriate stimuli in the environment. And then there's a communications network, in this case, a chemical communications network, that signals this motor whether it should go forward or backward. So what a bacterium actually does is it plows along with its motor going counterclockwise and it moves in the forward direction. It plows along as long as it finds itself going towards attractive molecules. It's basically looking for a free meal. So as long as it can sniff out good things ahead of it, it goes in that direction. But when and if it begins to smell less of the good stuff or it begins to smell something aversive, like another animal that might want to eat the bacterium, then the motor turns around and goes clockwise, taking the bacterium away from the trouble. And here's how the molecular pathway actually works that mediates that. Here again is a portion of the bacterial cell. Here's the little proton turbine that's going around driving the animal to your left through the environment. And the key of sensory transduction in this apparatus <clears throat> is the binding of an appropriate molecule to its appropriate protein receptor. So here in the membrane of the bacterium is a specialized receptor molecule, a protein that captures an appropriate substance from the environment, which might be, for example, an amino acid. 
And when it captures this, it sets up a series of chemical signals. It doesn't matter what these things are called. They happen to be called key molecules because they're involved in chemotaxis, the process we're talking about. But each of these molecules is excited to a different state. That information is passed on in sort of a bucket brigade or relay until finally the last of them affects the motor and determines whether it goes forward or whether it goes backwards. And as you can appreciate, what a bacterium can approach or what a bacterium can avoid depends entirely on the particular constellation of these protein molecules that it has upon its surface. And that is, of course, genetically determined and can be studied in the laboratory. Something quite analogous to this happens in our own case in taste reception. Our taste is mediated by taste buds. And if you look upon the surface of your tongue or in the mirror or at somebody else's tongue, you can see that the tongue has a bunch of little bumps on it that are here greatly magnified in a light microscope. Here's a single one of these bumps, which is called a papilla. And alongside the papilla are a series of little organs that are magnified farther here called taste buds. In the electron microscope, each of these little taste buds is seen to look like a, an orange with a series of sections or a hand of garlic cloves. Each of these consists of a single uh, cell with a nucleus here. The cell has sort of a pointed top surface with little feelers on it called microvilli. And at the bottom, the cell makes what's called a synapse. That is a contact with a nerve fiber that's going to carry information into the brain. That's seen schematically here. Here again is this orange-like array of sensory receptor cells in a taste bud. Each of them has its taste receptive end at this end and its synaptic or signaling end down at the base. Now if we look closely uh, at what goes on at the top end of one of these cells, what we find is that each of them is endowed with a large number of these little microvilli, these little protrusions sticking out of the top of the cell. And just like the bacterial surface, these microvilli bear specific molecular receptors that are going to be involved in what you can taste. So in this particular case, there are particular receptors that are shown studying the surface. And these receptors are sensitive to different types of molecules. As you well know, you can taste some substances, you can't taste others. And things have different tastes to them. Some are sweet, some are sour, some are bitter, and some are salty. So what exactly you experience depends upon which of these particular receptors you have. Now, in this particular cell, you can see receptors of two different types. There's one with a concavity to it that's capturing little asterisks. So let's suppose the asterisks are sugar molecules. Then this apparatus would capture sugar molecules. It would then have a chemical reaction, A going to B, that would set off some electrical signaling of the sort we'll see subsequently and give rise to a response in the cell. But notice that this cell also has another kind of receptor, this little V-shaped receptor over here. And that can respond to something else. So for example, this might be a sugar receptor. This might be a receptor for an artificial sweetener of the sort that's found in diet colas and the like. And so a person experiencing either an authentic sugar molecule or the artificial sweetener will be capable of experiencing both of these things as sweet. Again, the particular universe of tastes that we experience depends upon which of these receptor molecules is present. And we have a brief demonstration that's already been mentioned to you uh, to remind you of this. And that is, uh, we have a series of what are called taste papers. Uh, each of you should have in the tiny envelope that you can try to find at this point. Um, one each of three types of paper. As has been mentioned by Dr. Perpich, they're rather hard to see in the slide, and I apologize for that. But one of the papers is said to be white. One of the papers is pink. One of the papers is blue. And if you look at them very carefully, you may be able to see the difference. It helps to hold them up against the white surface or a little bit towards the light. And the object of the exercise is to see how your own genetic constitution influences what you can taste. So in the first instance, what I want those of you who want to participate to do is to try to find the white piece of paper and just taste it. Lick your lips and suck on it. It tastes like any other piece of tissue paper. It shouldn't have any particular taste. But this is just to remind you as a control. You seem to enjoy it. Um, <laughs> This is just to remind you as a control that it doesn't taste like anything in particular. And if you would, I'm told that you should put these back in the bag for disposal. Don't throw them at anyone. Now, the second thing I want you to try is the pink piece of paper. The pink piece of paper is coated with a chemical sodium benzoate. That's widely used as a food preservative. And interestingly, it's used as a food preservative causes trouble because people experience it in different ways. So some people experience it as sweet, sour, bitter, salty, or not at all. I can see one sour in the audience. 
there's a suite back there somewhere. So who, who experiences a suite? A few people here, okay, at least there's one honest person. Salty, a lot of salty, bitter, lots of bitter, sour, like lemon, some sours. Is anybody not tasted at all? So quite a few. So it's you know, on the order of a fifth each. So there's a wide distribution in this case of genetically inherited receptors that different people have that make them sensitive or not sensitive to this particular substance. The last of these papers is blue. This is coated with a chemical called PTC, whose name I won't give you in full. And it has only two effects. For some people, it tastes like nothing at all. For everybody else, it tastes like roadkill. So it, it will be really striking which you, to find out which you are. How many of you taste something like dead armadillo? OK, so this is, again, genetically predetermined, and you can test within your family to determine how the gene was passed down. Of American Caucasians, about 70% can taste it, and only 30 or so percent can't. But that varies racially. So, so for example, in Japanese American, 93% of people can taste. And Native Americans, who are derived from an Asiatic stock, have an even higher percentage of tasters. It's very rare to have people uh, of that group who don't taste it. OK. Now, the same principle is applied to an even greater extent in another one of our senses, which is the olfactory system. Humans can discriminate at least a 1,000 or so odors. And some other animals, like dogs that sniff truffles, explosives, and what have you, can dis discriminate still more odors. And this system works very much the same way. Olfactory receptor cells are specialized nerve cells that lie in a flattened sheet or epithelium. And they have specialized sensory cilia, little processes or hairs hanging down into the nasal mucus, which pick up odor molecules that bind to them. Now, these receptor cells then send information to a portion of the brain called the olfactory bulb. So this represents the human brain. And the olfactory bulb is this little tiny lobe of the brain sticking out towards its front. This puts it in exactly the right position. If you consider something like a human skull, then you find that the olfactory bulbs lie in these two little slots right here towards the front of the skull, which places them directly behind the nasal mucosa where the smelling goes on. So there's a very short distance between these two. The front end of the brain, the portion in this brain slice that's here at your left, represents then specialized cerebral cortex that does further processing of the olfactory information. And the way in which the information is processed is very much like what you've seen in the case of taste. Namely, each of these receptor cells has molecules on its surface that make it sensitive to a particular modality or type of odor. All of the thousands of cells sensitive to a given odor then send their information along an axon to a particular little cluster of connections in the olfact olfactory bulb called a glomerulus, which means a little ball. And interestingly, there are some 999 other groups of cells sending their axons to each of the 999 or so other glomeruli, so that the different odors are sorted out from the beginning by these projections. It's fascinating to find that the odor receptor molecules in this case also seem to be involved in getting the axons to their right target. This represents a real preparation from Richard Axel and Peter Mombertz in which a whole bunch of inputs are coming from olfactory receptor cells off the picture at the bottom. And you can see that their axons all go by one path or another to the same glomerulus. So these cells know exactly where they should send their axons to make the appropriate connection. And if you change the receptor molecule, the molecule that picks up spearmint or wintergreen or whatever odor happens to be involved, when you change that molecule, you also change the destination of these fibers. They go off somewhere else. So the odorant receptor molecules not only pick up the odorant, they also carry information about the connections that are going to be made once the axons grow out to the brain. Let me then turn to the issue of amplification. We've got the input as far as the cell. Now we want to make as large an electrical signal as possible. And that's done again and again in the nervous system by the use of so-called ion channels. The ion channels are small proteinaceous pores in the membrane that allow particular type of charged particles, ions like sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride, to flow across the membrane. Remember that in the case of most cells, the concentration of ions such as sodium are not the same inside and out. But instead, there are molecular pumps, called sodium pumps, 
that remove sodium ions from the cell and pump them out into the surrounding environment. And when they do so, they make the inside of the cell relatively negative. This is called the resting potential. It's usually about 60 millivolts or 60 thousandths of a volt. Now, when one separates charge this way, one in effect creates a battery. And one can use that battery to amplify sensory information. And here's how. Imagine that one has a little channel right here. It's a proteinaceous pore that can let sodium ions flow through. And the fact that sodium flows through depends upon the diameter of the pore and its particular molecular uh, constitution. Then we have some apparatus, in this case a little person of some stripe or another, that's capable of opening or closing the gate that lets the ions flow. Let's suppose, in fact, that this person is sensitive to some sensory input, such as temperature. So this person opens the gate when it's hot, closes the gate when it's cold. That apparatus beautifully amplifies the signal. If the person opens the gate only for about 10 milliseconds, or 10 thousandth of a second, which is a typical time for an ion channel to be open, that will let as many as one million sodium ions flow in. And of course, the sodium ions carrying positive charge make the inside of the cell relatively positive again. <clears throat> now you can readily compute how much amplification this apparatus achieves. You know, for example, that the work that the little person has to do is equal to the product of the force that he exerts times the distance that he moves. And we know the force is necessary to open channels and how far the gates have to swing. So we get a value of three zepto joules. Now, zepto is not a handy household world word. It refers to 10 to the minus 21st. OK, it's a very small number. We can then ask how much energy change occurs as a result of the sodium flowing into the cell. And that's computed from the number of sodium ions that flow, about a million, the charge on the sodium ions, and the voltage across which they flow, here 50 millivolts. And that turns out to be about 30 femtojoules, or 30 times 10 to the minus 15 joules. So the amplification that's achieved is just the ratio between the energy that comes out and the work that goes in, and that turns out to be about 10 million fold. And the point is that this very simple device is capable of enormous magnification, enormous amplification, just by opening and closing a little gate and using the battery that's been created by the sodium pump, one can get enormous amplification of signals until one has something that's large enough for the nervous system to interpret. <clears throat>